This week on Back to the Movies, we're talking super bad. This guy's either going to think, here's another kid with a fake ID, or here's McLovin, the 25-year-old Hawaiian organ donor. I am McLovin. We're going back to the movies. 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 Movies. Yeah. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Back to the Movies, the silver screen time machine where we travel back to a specific year of cinema history and explore what made it special. This season, we're going back to 2007. I'm your host, Ben, and with me as always is my co-host, Nat McGee. Nat, how's it going, man? It's going good, Ben. I'm a little hot and bothered, though. It's really, really gross. Worldwide, I think. Oh, I thought you were coming in with an issue right now. You're like, I'm hot and bothered. Something's grinding my gears. <laughs> you mean you're literally hot and it's bothering you. Yes, I, exactly. Exactly. So I am true. hot and I am bothered by the fact that I'm hot. How are you doing? You know, I guess Vermont is, is the only spot in the country that isn't, you know, suffering a heat wave right now. It's wonderful right now. I wore a sweatshirt today. Vermont is bulletproof. It, it, it will never be affected by climate change, right? It's, it's the dome. Or zombie viruses because it's too cold. That's what we <laughs> learned from Mayan legend. Ben, we have a guest in the virtual studio today. Well, should we bring her on instead of just talking nonsense? She is a longtime fan and a very good friend. It's Izzy Kagan. Izzy, what's up? Hi. It's really weird to hear you guys do the intro on this. I feel like I'm on my way to work. <laughs> the subway. I mean, you are recording while you're driving through New York City, right? Yeah, yeah. We're moving. That's what we insist of all our guests is that they record in a dangerous situation. It keeps the energy up. If you feel, oh, if you hear man. the honking, it'll, it'll be a sign. <laughs> Izzy was saying that she wanted to be on the show because... She's very opinionated about movies. Is that correct? You you have a lot to say, I think. And I think you're going to be a good addition to all of this because this is going to be this is a big episode in our in our canon here for 2007. This is one of the big ones. I've yeah. been called the worst person to see a movie with um, more than <laughs> more than once. Um, and actually preparing for this show has given me a really great tool for my impending marriage because I took oh. notes, so I didn't just say to Jonah every single thing that I was thinking, and it worked oh. like a charm. I was silent. So you're just going to take notes every time you watch a movie for Yeah, realize? for that... no for no purpose other than to just... <laughs> and then just hand the, hand the notes over to whoever you were watching with. Yeah, if you're interested, here's my essay. <laughs> and to clarify, your fiancé's name is Jonah. We aren't talking about, for instance, oh, yes. Jonah Hill, star of tonight's <laughs> film. No, no. Uh, my fiancé is Jonah Hill. Um, oh, that's wow. why this wow. is a very, no. Wow, well, but we didn't want him on the episode. We'd <laughs> rather talk to you. Congratulations. Exactly. I cannot wait to go to that wedding. That's going to be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Will Michael Sarah be there too? In case you haven't realized, we are talking about Superbad today. A teen movie classic from 2007. Probably one of the most quoted comedies of, 2000, of the 2000s. A watershed film. Yeah, just uh, a big, and big a deal movie. a hugely important, or at least... Uh, um, I don't know if important is the right word because I don't know ultimately how much this movie actually changed, but as far as making a splash in the zeitgeist of teenagers in 2007, it didn't get any bigger than super bad. Nope. It was, it was huge. Before we go any further, we would just like to ask our fans and loyal listeners to please give us a five-star review on Apple podcasts when you can. Um, it really helps out with the algorithms and the mysteries of the internet. And you can also follow us at BTTMPod on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And you can also email us, BTTMPod at gmail.com. So please do all that if you are so inclined. Also, before we start talking about Superbad, do you want to talk a little bit about any movies that we watched this week other than Superbad for the cinephiles in the audience? Ben? Or Izzy, I'm sorry. Guest first. Yeah, Izzy, you watch anything good this weekend? I also watched Knocked Up in oh. around this movie just to kind of get extra like extra credit yeah, yeah yeah extra credit but that wasn't good that was not what I, I liked what i really liked was i rewatched mystery men oh i fucking love mystery men it was <laughs> amazing it was so good it, it was oh, like so i remembered good. exactly how it was i used to watch it i had the vhs when i was a kid yeah that's a relic of a movie i, oh. I feel like it's a harbinger of things to come god gave me a gift I shovel well. I shovel really well. It has so many, like, the, watching it with Superbad, where, like, you know, Mystery Man was a total flop. 
nobody cared. But it is so, like that one I thought was really quotable and had such a good story structure. And the characters were like really well developed. And in this movie, there's none of that. Uh oh. Spoiler. Oh, oh, we're getting into it hot and heavy right up front. This is going to be a hate cast, huh? I'm going to be fighting the enemies at the gates on this one. Uh oh. <laughs> hey, I haven't revealed how I feel about the film yet. I mean, you've read the show notes, so you might have some sense of how I feel about the film. But yeah, Mystery Men is awesome. And also, it was the movie that brought us Smash Mouth, right? Yeah. It's got All Star. And the I remember first. that Smash Mouth's music video was based not on Shrek, but on Mystery Men. Oh, so you're right, it was in Shrek was... too, And it was also in that Rat Race movie. Yeah, it was a three movie supreme. It's just mm -hmm. like any movie, let's end it with Mystery Men, it's or with um, All Star. I actually heard A Beautiful Mind almost ended with All Star, but they, they somehow <laughs> switched it at the last minute. Uh, is he favorite Mystery Man hero? I, I mean, I guess it would have to be William H. Macy, because he's, he's so good. That scene where he's in uh, the kitchen with his wife and she's like telling him that he's just a good father and a good husband and nothing more. And she puts her like rubber gloved hands on the camera. <laughs> it's such a good shot. And it's so, we were, I was watching it with all of my neighbors in the building. Someone said that it was uh, very Terry Gilliam like. Oh, yeah. There's well, like a lot of really crazy costumes and it's like very dark. It takes place in such a defined crazy world yeah it's like it like kind of they really did a lot of production design yeah alternate reality where everything looks like japan basically which i think was exactly. a, a real 90s thing clearly i want to turn this into a mystery men cast so now why don't you tell us what you watch this week i watched this movie that's it's it's getting a little bit of traction on the old letterbox because of fast and furious uh this movie better luck tomorrow it's another la crime movie this time in orange county and director Justin Lin, who went on to direct a couple other Fast and Furious movies. And it's it's kind of cropped up because it has Han, who's a main character in Fast and Furious, in like a completely different movie. It's like one of those things where he jumped over into Fast and Furious from this movie. Same actor, same name and everything. So you don't just mean the actor. You mean the character is coded to be effectively the same person. Exactly. That's it's really a total, cool. That's weird. total universe jump. And the movie itself had some cool elements. It's like this Asian American high school crime movie. It was kind of a good one to watch before Superbad because it's it's all about these high schoolers who have ambitions, but instead to just have sex, they they want to like deal drugs and shit and like make money and steal computers and stuff. It was not the best movie ever, but it was interesting. An interesting time capsule, like two thousand two high school. Filmmaking has changed so much since since that movie was made, at least in terms of like style and soundtrack and stuff. So what did you watch, Ben? A couple weeks ago on our Oceans 13 episode, we were fan casting Soderbergh actors who weren't in Oceans movies. Well, this last week I watched a Steven Soderbergh crime ensemble film with our number one pick, Benicio Del Toro, his new movie, No Sudden Move. No Sudden Move. How was it? I thought it was really good. It's a very strange film. Uh, it has a lot of ideas at play and a really interesting like rhythm and feel to it that wasn't what I was expecting. I mean, whenever you see Soderbergh nice. crime, big cast, you you think it's going to be zippy and light. And this was not that. Yeah, it, it looks pretty dense. It, it's a little like I, I it looks like a big a big movie to watch. Is that it's sad and cynical and, yeah. and kind of mellow, <laughs> but I loved it. I, I loved all the period details. The cast was fantastic. Uh, uh, David Harbour is quickly becoming one of my all-time favorite character actors, puts in a great performance in that movie. Mm -hmm. I, I really recommend it. All right, I'll check it out. Okay, let's get to business here. We're talking about Super Bad, this behemoth movie. And yeah, what, what, how are we starting with this? Are we just going to say flat out how we felt about Super Bad? Um, I, if it helps, <laughs> I, I wrote... I think already did. <laughs> yeah, but I also wrote a sentence at the top of my notes. I don't know if you can see it, but... So I wrote super bad, like, you know, because that was what I was going to take notes about. And then at the end, I just wrote, <laughs> is a mostly boring movie. Oh, oh, I okay. was so bored. <laughs> wow. All right. I mean, I can't say the same. Ben, what about you? What, what do we got? Put your put your cards on the table. I think that's a pretty accurate view. I did actually get pretty Sick. bored. You know, I, I recognize <laughs> that it's not a bad film, and I think it's got a couple of things going for it. Yeah. I think the performances from all of the actors are really strong, stronger than you wouldn't get 
from a movie like this. I'm going to compare it to American Pie more than once this episode, and that's a great example there, where, like, these are real characters and actors delivering real nuanced performances compared to something like that. I think they all deserve credit for what they're doing there. I think the movie really lacks structure, and it's <laughs> and it, it makes it hard to kind of feel like you're being pulled through it. I get, I got bored. I started to tune out. It's also just so removed from my personal experience and yeah. interests that I cannot really relate to these kids as much as I need to for the coming of age movie like this to work. I didn't wow. like it in 2007 and I don't like it now. Ben, we're going to get along great. Oh my God. This conversation is going to go very well. Did you like it in 2007, Izzy? Did you see it when you were in high school? Um, I don't think I liked this one as much i was a really big fan of knocked up when it came out and then i've not watched either of them i think i like yeah i just was more into knocked up because it was maybe more it's female centric bigger broader more female centric for sure yeah. yeah the women do not fare well in super bad no and i think i sort of recognized that when it came out but i certainly wasn't as adverse to it at sure. the time but we don't want to just shit on Superbad this entire time. Nat, yes. what do you like think about this movie? I, unlike you, Ben, heavily identify with this movie. These guys <laughs> were me. Like, not to the level of horniness, at least externally. Um, I, I never talked the way they do in this movie. But their stupid-ass thought processes are kind of like exact thought processes that I had when I was this age. <laughs> and I thought that the authenticity of like the, the dialogue and the way the characters think the world works, it just hit me so hard then as just like straight-up funny. And now it hits me as like so gloriously authentic and disgusting and ribald or whatever that like I just love this movie. It's so it's so truthful this movie. And I recognize that there's some plot malfunctions and that there's some roundabout shit going on and like yeah, it it probably could lose like 10 minutes. But man, I just I think this is like a classic teen comedy without the soul that you'd expect from from other teen comedies. Like this is not a Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Or an American Graffiti, which I've never seen, but I know probably has more soul than this movie. House Party? Um, Compared to our first a, season? Yeah, House Party. House Party is, an, is a movie of soul. This movie has no soul. This is a movie about really terrible people that you kind of hope are going to learn something. And you're not entirely sure if they do at the end, but it doesn't matter because it was just funny to watch them interact. Uh, so that's how I feel about it. I just... I love this goddamn movie. Good. Um, I think it's really so, important we represent that viewpoint because people love this movie. This is a beloved film. Like this, this movie is important to people, particularly people who saw it in 2007 when they were in high school and connected with these characters. Well, and we also had a dearth of these types of movies for a while. American Pie was huge and there were a couple other teen movies, but that was before our personal time. We were 17 when this movie came out and I was hankering for one of these to come out when when I was in high school. They they just weren't making them. Everything was PG-13. It, it was like Amanda Bynes movies, like She's the Man and like <laughs> shit like that where like it just wasn't rated R. It, it, it like this was like the time of high school musical for God's sake. So Dude, I want to talk this... about that, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> when this came out, it was it was a huge deal and it, it was also on the tails of Knocked Up and 40 year old virgin, virgin so yeah. i was just so ready for this one the whole judd apatow comedy renaissance i mean yeah it, considering how quickly that has faded from the zeitgeist in the last decade and a half it's sort of hard to remember how huge that was how revolutionary that felt nobody was making comedy movies like that in the decades no. leading up to it you know the closest would be like maybe like in the 70s they're doing stuff like that but all the high concept stuff in the 80s and then going to the 90s was really slick and studio produced. Nobody was doing these really down and dirty comedy films that were just getting funny people on camera, letting them be funny. Uh, and it felt like something radical. Even though it was like made by Sony. Do you think that it was <laughs> just that it was like a good crop of actors, though? That Could what be. Judd Apatow's thing is that he was able to spot some really good people. I think he had a way of working too that brought out the best in them. Mm. He had trust in them. He he allowed them to do what they thought was funny, 
And what they thought was funny hit more often than it missed. Yeah. And then all the improv We can talk about that, too, when we talk about things like some of the casting of some of the actors in this, where it's just really like people were given shots that wouldn't have been given shots if this was a, a 60, 70, 80 million dollar studio comedy film. I like that you have a prompt here on the show notes. How big was Superbad at your high school? Dude, everybody fucking talked about Superbad all the time. I remember that so distinctly. <laughs> everybody I knew thought this was the funniest film they had ever seen. Wow. I don't remember that. I feel like kids at my high school didn't really give a shit about movies. They were like more indicative of this of this current generation. They just cared about what the kids in this movie care about, which is like getting fucking high and drunk all the time and, and hooking up. I wonder if part of it was this movie has kind of this vague retro aesthetic. Uh, you know, it, yeah. it, it's clearly set in the modern day. Kids have cell phones and whatnot, but it also feels a little bit more like seventies or eighties and Vermont, particularly before the internet became widespread, always felt like it was like a decade behind culturally. Yeah. So this really fit. This really felt like what it was like to be a teenager in Vermont as much as anything. Mm. I mean, it felt, the same for me too just not in the suburbs like like i don't know it's it just this was like the most authentic high school movie i'd ever seen other than maybe fast times but even fast times has like 40 year olds playing 18 year olds <laughs> and it's like really stupid looking do you know what the um, age of the actors were jonah hill's uh, 23 okay chris romance plaza 17 in this movie and michael Sarah's is like 20 right in the middle no he's like 18 18 he's okay. 18 yeah they're oh. legit Wow. The girls are, That's are than older. I thought. Yeah. The girls are older. They looked it. Um, but <laughs> especially, I think Becca's like 24 or something. Yeah. And, and Emma Stone was probably like 22 or 21. Yeah. I just, it, it hit hard. Was, were people really into, into Super Bad at your high school, Izzy? Was, was this like a huge deal? I don't really remember, but certainly people saw it. Yeah. We have to do the plot summary. What are you going to call it this week? Ah, uh, Super. Super rad. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm so bad at coming up with, with uh, names for the story minute on the fly. I really need to come up with them in advance. But I'm ready to go. Just give me a, give me a countdown. Three, two, one, go. Best friends in high school, Seth and Evan, have a goal, which is to get with their respective crushes. They are graduating high school and it's getting close to the end so they need to make their move before the summer so that they can get good at sex so what they devise a plan to procure alcohol for one of their parties or for a big party that's happening that night and that way they will be ingratiated into the girls uh good graces i don't know that was a bad sentence and there's lots of hijinks there's some cops that meet up with their friend fogel who's a total dweeb and there's a lot of debauchery and it ends up that they neither of them actually hook up with the girls but they do sort of make headway into having more meaningful relationships with the girls than just fucking them and they part ways at the end and they learn about <laughs> friendship and they learn about friendship and yes menstrual cycles <laughs> yes yes so yeah that was kind of a shitty plot summary i i think everyone listening to this kind of knows the gist though the movie's plot light there's like three major set pieces that vignettes sort of take place in and around and then there's the cop storyline which is pretty much removable from everything else yeah i i think that seth and evan's story like all the random missions that they have to go on are they they keep the thing moving. But there's really well just the one. Me. They go from school to the liquor store to the yeah. house party. That's it. They don't go one anywhere mission. else. And then they run around in the neighborhood. But that's it. Yeah. But they always have a goal in mind. They do. It's more than like a like just like a hangout. Sure. There's there's always a mission in mind of some kind. Even at the end, it's like we have to go get a comforter. So it's kind of nice and tidy in that way. Well, let's do a quick book report corner because there's at least one piece of critical information that I think you need to know about this movie to understand why it is the way it is. And I think that speaks to my and Izzy's criticism of the film. Mm. The movie was born out of a childhood friendship. It was a script that Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg started writing when they were 13 years old. And it's not like an idea they had when they were 13 and then later when they broke into Hollywood were like, hey, should we revisit that? They worked on it continually. 
throughout high school and through, you know, when they were getting their early acting jobs and writing jobs for Evan. And so this was something, this was a work in progress for them for decade plus. This was their passion project. They always wanted to see this movie get made. Once they did become established, Seth Rogen breaking out thanks to Judd Apatow and Freaks and Geeks, and then in 40 Year Old Virgin, and then in Knocked Up the same year, like getting his first big leading role, they still had a lot of trouble getting traction for the script because it was largely structureless, full of profanity, which wasn't in vogue at the time. And so Apatow kind of incubated it while they were looking for a studio to pick it up. And so for years, it was just kind of floating around between Seth and Evan and Apatow and Apatow's crew. And so it, it has this very loose formation, this kind of hive mind idea. Seth Rogen talks about how Jake Kasdan, who was the director of Walk Hard that we talked about earlier this season, yes. came in and like created the whole structure for the movie. That like the movie didn't even have a structure until Jake was there. And then one night they're smoking weed with Jake Kasdan and they're talking about the movie and they're working on it. And they're like, oh, you need to do this and this and this. And the movie used to end at the party. And he's like, no, you need the scene afterwards where they reveal, you know, where they come together as friends and you get the emotional catharsis and all that kind of stuff. He definitely came up with the gold slick vodka. That is such a movie. It's like the one. <laughs> you need a specific thing. You need you need something memorable <laughs> that the audience can latch on to. Yeah. And ultimately, because of this, and because of Abitau's involvement, that's why the movie gets made. You know, he comes on early on in his trajectory too, before he is a big name in Hollywood. But simultaneously, while they're developing the script, Apatow blows up. He has 40-Year-Old Virgin, which is a huge hit. R-rated comedies are back. And so because of his involvement and with his help, the film finally gets off the ground. Yeah, and, and the world's a better place for it. No, But, I mean, the core of it is the, the critical thing to understand is that this is a script that was born out of two teenagers writing about their teenage experiences. Basically, everything that happens in the movie was something that either happened to Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg or something that they heard happened to a friend of theirs. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I definitely spent a lot of time worrying about how to get alcohol for a lot of my teenage and college years. And I was a total loser. So, like, this movie just really reeks of authenticity to me. Watching it this time around, like, I just really recognized how awful the main characters are. And but like how it's also played to be funny. And like, I hope that it's like through creating the movie, they kind of the creators kind of worked that out themselves. They were actually way younger than us, though. So maybe they still thought it was like, it's true. Just like Seth authentic Rogen was and like funny. 23, I guess. And Evan would have been around the same age at the time this film yeah. finally got made. So they they were we are already like advancing in years way beyond the guys who literally wrote and created this movie other than the director who's who was in his um in his forties at the time. Yeah. So. His name's Greg uh, Motola. He's not really, I don't think we'll spend a lot of time talking about him because he's kind of a second stringer in the Apatow camp who hasn't really made a lot of great movies. Clearly isn't one of the creative impetuses of this film. Well, I do wonder one thing about that though. I, I was looking into this because you mentioned earlier that this movie does have like that seventies aesthetic. And I was like, for a movie that is hailed as like the movie of a, of a teenage generation, ours being teenagers in like the mid slash late 2000s it's funny that like our quote-unquote teen movie has this sure. very 70s aesthetic it's it's not it wasn't cool to be 70s or like it wasn't like popular like if this movie was authentic in that regard it would have had like soldier boy playing at the at the party um and i was wondering if if Matola brought that to the table like if he was like let's give this movie some flavor but i think that's also because like Apatow and the other people of his age all grew up in the 70s. So they're nostalgic for their teenagerhood. And I was also wondering if, if a lot of those references are drawn specifically from Seth and Evan's experiences. You know, it's not but hard so, to imagine. They're like, so young. They're, they're young. Not, they were born in the 80s. Yeah, but they were clearly, you know, they're born in the 80s, but they're born in Canada, Vancouver, which I think, like Vermont, tends to be a little <laughs> bit behind. Culturally, but things like, you know, like the presence of like Metallica t-shirts and posters all over the place that feels very much like one of these guys was super into Metallica when they were in high school. Well, yeah. it's also sort of at the time there was a lot of like graphic tees, graphic tees were in and there was a lot yeah. of uh, like nostalgia kind of logos. And, you know, I don't know how long the whole wearing an old band t-shirt of a band that you've never heard of started, but that seemed to be very prevalent then. 
Yeah, I think there's some special magic though. To, we'll get into the movie because it's it's very you know integral to this opening credit sequence. Is that it's a it's like this reference to um, I think it's like a Pam Greer like like Foxy Brown movie where they're dancing. And it, it also reminded me of like the old uh, iPod ads. Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's super <laughs> 70s and it's the Bar K's Too Hot to Stop, which I just, whenever I hear this song, I just think of super bad, of course, because it's like iconic. And yeah, it just, it makes the movie like funky and special to me. Yeah. Like that they, it's not just another kind of generic 2000s comedy. It's like, it, this one has a little bit more personality it has a little bit more funk and they're like taking an aesthetic and really rolling with it throughout the whole movie even with like the costumes that that seth and evan and fogel wear they are like not they just don't fit in i think it's so perfect that they they use this 70s aesthetic to make to like sketch these characters so well but and it's not just them too it's like joe latrugio is like wearing a weird 70s outfit and like that (laughs) whole vibe of that house party where they're like hanging out in the room doing drugs. I don't know. Like that doesn't feel 2007 to me. But then like the the, the other house party is very 2007. Like um, even just the way that like Jules and Becca are, are dressed. I feel like it's pretty typical of the time. Like it's mm-hmm. not like everybody's in the 70s. All right. Let's get into the movie. Let's start talking about it. You already mentioned the opening credits. They are iconic. It's a great choice. It gets you like acclimated to the characters before you even meet them. Body language yeah. is so important mm-hmm. to communication and like the way somebody dances tells you so much about how they feel about themselves. They look so bad in those, in those <laughs> outlines. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. <laughs> With this too tight shirt and then fucking Michael Sarah's hoodie and like his, his pants are a little too short. So you see his ankles with the sneakers. <laughs> it's so funny. I love a good opening um, sequence. <laughs> then we cut to, to real life and we meet our main characters, Seth and Evan, named after the writers, Seth and Evan, played by Jonah Hill and Michael Sarah. Oh, yeah. I did not catch that. I was just calling them Jonah Hill and Michael Sarah the whole time. <laughs> Summer of Sarah. We already had Juno. Yes. Do we have another one on our schedule with him or is this it? This, I think this is it. I was a big Michael Sarah fan back then because I was a big Arrested Development fan. So I was yep. super excited to see this guy come come out into the the big time and he's doing very much a george michael kind of thing in a way that i loved because i love george michael now you mentioned that when we watched juno and you were absolutely right this is way more george michael than his character in juno who is like kind of chill in a way that this character is not no this character is a he's a goddamn mess they're both messes but i think evan especially is like kind of i don't know i think he learns a good lesson at the end of the movie but in the beginning he's kind of conniving kind of evil in a way uh, both of them are actually. They're just but... selfish in the way that teenagers are. Yeah, he's super awkward. It's it's Michael Sarah. He's doing what he does best. This was the, the peak Sarah. It was all kind of downhill from here. I think like he's just kind of. They put him in a couple other big ass movies. He never he never could Year break one. out of that mold. Yeah. No. Uh, I like it when he plays into that type. I liked him in Molly's Game. I liked him in um, uh, End of the World. What was that movie called? The disaster one with World's End or the uh, this is the end. This is the end. Yeah. And then you got Jonah, Jonah Hill, who we I had only really seen him from from Knocked Up and Forty Year Old Virgin, and also one of the great movies of the two thousands, Accepted, which filmed at our alma mater, Chapman University. <laughs> Not an inconsiderable reason why I went to that school. I liked that movie. <laughs> it's a good movie. I wish we were covering it. So. Hill's an interesting <laughs> one in this movie, and it's worth talking about his casting because I alluded to earlier how it kind of reflects Apatow's whole vibe and how that shaped the movies he made. He was a hard sell for the movie. He was 23. He was too old. That's what everyone thought. But after trying out a bunch of people, a bunch of people who weren't right, Apatow's like, Jonah's the best we got. I want Jonah for this role. So while they were on the set of 40 Year Old Virgin, he literally has Jonah go into his trailer and do an audition tape. And runs it over to Sony that day, that day, and gets him cast in the movie. Like, it's like, he's just like, yeah, we're going to do this instead. And then they just do that. There's no long wow. process. There's no big audition. It's just, it's all about staying open to what happens. Yeah. And I, I think that their chemistry is really good. Like, it, I think it worked out pretty well. Yeah. I, I think Jonah Hill is really good in this movie. I think, you know, there was a lot of surprise when he started moving towards more dramatic roles. But you can see it even here that the guy's got chops. 
Yeah. There's a lot of subtle stuff happening in between the, you know, the profanity that is really informing who this guy is. And if there's anything that I can relate to, it's, it's Seth's, you know, awkwardness and self-loathing, his loneliness, you know, is is the fact that, you know, he's like this overweight big guy who doesn't feel like he's got a lot of friends. I I get that. And I think Jonah Hill's doing a lot of that under the surface because the character is written with this kind of crazy bravado. Ben, do you want to talk about being Jonah Hill? (laughs) I mean, I mentioned it, I think, at the end of last episode. When I was at the end of high school and going to college, I looked exactly like Jonah Hill looks like in this movie. I was about the same weight. I was a little taller, but I had the curly hair, about the same height. I wore cargo shorts and button-down shirts. And you didn't have a beard, which you do now, and that that really takes it over the top, I think. And uh, I was frequently (laughs) told that I looked like Jonah Hill, which is really good for your self-esteem when you're 20 years old and you don't feel particularly good about the way you look. And uh, Oh, God. We made a movie about We did that Usual Suspects parody. Where, like, you were Kaiser Soze, but you were actually Jonah Hill. <laughs> Something like that. I don't even remember. It was anymore. very convoluted. I wish that there uh, was more of that in the movie. Like, yeah. I did not pick up on very much of Jonah Hill's self loathing or, like, self consciousness about his appearance up until the very end where he was, like, the shirt's too tight or something like that. And he yeah. talked yeah, about when like, he's slimming drunk, down. He lets it out a little when he's drunk. I think, it, yeah, it's like implicit that. A, they're stupid teenagers, and and B, it's like their plan is, it just reeks of desperation. That, like, the only way these people will hook up with us is if they are drunk. And there's hints to it, like the bullying in the beginning of the movie, and then, like, when Michael Sarah leaves him alone in the lunchroom, and there's there's no one else there, right? He's alone. But it isn't really part of the character, except in subtext. I think one of the most unrealistic parts of this movie, other than all the crazy shit that happens, (laughs) is that clearly. Seth and Evan are being played by these famous actors who are, you know, super amazing to watch. Those guys are too cool. They're, they're, like, I know they're dorks and they are, are like, supposed to be losers, but, like, they're so adult and watchable. Like, I think they would mm-hmm. slay in the popularity contest at a real high school. <laughs> Absolutely. They, they cut. There's that scene where they're at the cafeteria and, and uh, Jonah Hill's like, what am I supposed to do, sit here like that guy? Like, he, he says some kid's name. And they, he points over to this kid who's sitting alone. And I'm like, that's the fucking kid. Yeah, that's yeah. Like the actual loser at high school. Also, that, that name was a real childhood friend of Seth and Evans, who still gets comments <laughs> to this day about it. Glanzer or Glazer, whatever his name was. I was reading that originally the initial idea when they were like actually getting serious about making the movie was that Seth Rogen was going to play Seth. How do you think that would have gone, Izzy? Do you think that would have been better or worse than Jonah Hill? Oh, no. Or- that would have been a bummer. Because I think, ju- like all your the stuff you're talking about with their uh, the subtleties and the emotional stuff happening under the surface, that's all the actors. That's not any of the writing. It seems like it's so much of what they're bringing to it, just in their facial expressions and the way their voice sounds. And I don't think Seth Rogen, at least at that time, was capable of mm. being more than just yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's true. There's an anger to Jonah Hill very that Seth Rogen doesn't have. Seth is, is kind of soft when, when Jonah's got totally. like, you know, he's got the rage, which is, I think, really critical to making this character read, at least for me. Yeah. I, and I also think Seth Rogen has never looked a day under 25. Absolutely. Even when he was at Freaks and Geeks. In 40-Year-Old Virgin, <laughs> I remember like, you know, seeing him and I was like, that guy's great. Who is that guy? And looking him up and I'm like, wow, he's only like four years older than me or something. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> and he seems like he's got like 20 years on me in that movie. It's it's nuts. So I, I agree. I just thought it was a fun thought experiment. I honestly think um, it would be kind of terrifying if he was playing Seth. I don't know. Yeah. It would be weird. He's so close to him personally. <laughs> yeah. Hey, speaking of the character Seth, should we talk about dicks? Yeah. The dick drawing. Mm. <laughs> Izzy, please illuminate me. Illuminate that that <laughs> beautiful comment there. Well, I was just I felt like he should have been encouraged in his art a little bit more <laughs> instead of punished for drawing them. because uh, some oh of those were God. actually they include, you know, maybe it was just getting a little too fanciful in the art direction, but like some of those drawings were great, very detailed, very creative. Like there's this one of like a, you know, like a sushi chef. 
at the end, there's a Doctor Strange love. Doctor, there's also a chestburster alien, which I like. Very creative, and I think if he had just had some kind of an interest, that would have been because that's the thing. These characters have nothing else that they're interested in besides sex and booze. <laughs> yes, that's it. And at least yes. like you know, Seth and Evan, the real Seth and Evan, were into movies. They were into writing the script. They had like a little project that they were doing, and they got nothing. They didn't add one line that's like. Oh yeah, we're gonna go to the comic book store, or like, <laughs> not one no, line. I swear, they go through it. it. Michael Sarah <laughs> plays video games for like thirty seconds, and is then like, I hate video games. Let's talk about sex. Yeah, and like you know he's smart. Well, and they, it's not even like they're just they're just horned up this one night where the stakes are really high. They also cut back to them like a week ago when they got drunk and tried to go to a strip club, and like they are just total pieces of shit. There's not a <laughs> single other thing, and if he had just been told. You're a good artist. Just move on from dicks. Then maybe something really cool could have happened for him. He would have gotten Emma Stone in a legitimate way. It's true. He's he's kind of resigned to a little bit of loserdom in this movie because he's going to like state school or whatever. Like it, it, yeah. the lines have kind of been drawn that like Seth is not going to Dartmouth with Bogle and Evan, and he's he's feeling like he's left behind, and he just thinks he wasn't smart enough to get in. Which is sad. Fun fact about the dicks. They were all drawn by Evan Goldberg's brother. Mm. He's a good artist. Yeah. And a lawyer, too, I guess. Even at the time, was a practicing lawyer. Which is just funny to me. This was a big moment in Superbad. It, at least when you were watching it for the first time. It's so iconic. It's, which I don't know what that says about the movie. Uh, it's It's crazy. I also wanted to point out Evan's school schedule on this day. Maybe it's a Friday. But he's got <laughs> math. Followed by home ec, followed by gym, followed by shop class. Those are his four classes. So he's mostly doing physical labor at high school. But yeah, we, we kind of follow them around and the stakes get set. We learn about Jules's party. They have crushes on, on Jules and Becca, their, their respective crushes. They're super awkward around them. And Jules is going to have a huge party. Now, do you think that he like has always had a crush on Jules? Or do you think it's just since she got hot over the summer? They certainly imply it's the latter. I think it's the latter. Right. Yeah. And also she's been so unavailable for so long. She's dated lots of different dudes, apparently. Mm. Oh, I see. One thing that's that's interesting about the writing of this movie, they aren't afraid to like not explain things. They're, they just talk about other random kids and you just kind of get it based on the way they talk about them. Like that line I was sure. talking about earlier where they, I mean, this is a bad example because they actually point to the kid. But like you just understand the subtext of all these all these things they're saying, and it just makes the world feel really alive of this like shitty ass high school. They never forget what kids have done in the last four years. Nothing is sacred. Nothing is forgotten. That world becomes so small by the time you leave it. Yeah, you know every part of it, and you know everyone in it. Yeah, um, and it just feels real. It feels like you walked into a high school, and like they're talking shit about people, and they're not just gonna sit back and explain who all these people are unlike a lot of high school movies like it doesn't really matter like people just kind of float in and out of the movie a little bit like dave franco never shows up again he's in right. that one scene where they shit on him and that's that's kind of it and a couple of them do but i i just like that the movie's not afraid to just like throw out some characters throw out some references to characters that we never see and you just kind of you just kind of get it because it's probably based on a real person in real life can we talk about the home ex scene yes sure. what do you got <laughs> The Asian kid, whose name I'm now forgetting, but like Hiroki, Hiroki, that just made me so sad because they gave him like no lines. I know they made him act like really cute, like a little kitty. He does that little yeah. thing, and he's just like like you know stereotypically like confident and silent and has a super Asian name. It is true. They play it for laughs that he is a competent little Asian guy. Yeah. Again, maybe scripts written by teenagers <laughs> or just like a bunch of white dudes even. And they're smoking weed in their 20s. Yeah, and also the whole, like, humping Emma Stone is a little fucking insane. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> it's so stupid that I, I couldn't help but kind of laugh at it. Because you would never do that in real life. And this is the movies. It's so pronounced and so crazy that I was cracking up at his ridiculous gestures. But also, that would have been a great time to, like, set up some connection between him and Emma Stone that they could use later yeah. on. They had they had no conversation. And then later when like they were 
there's like a later scene where like maybe they're about to kiss or something and the only bit of patter she's got is well that was really fun with the tiramisu earlier it was ugly but you <laughs> yeah. know tasted really good and then later when they're at the mall and she's like they you know go they pair off and they go their separate ways at the end and the the little bit of like line she has is so can you help me pick out what kind of concealer to wear and it's like what they have nothing they got nothing that's they got nothing they, not a single thing that's like no shared remember interest. we shared that time in fourth grade where that kid was really mean to me and he, no nothing and becca's only one is that she's a she's a rat fink she ratted out jonah hill to uh to the authorities when she was in fourth grade uh yeah this movie doesn't treat the women great i mean the worst one by far is is fogel's girl whose name I don't even remember at this point. I think it's Alexa. Who ju- is just there to be ogled. Gets like three lines of dialogue before she takes her shirt off. And every single girl in this high school is hot. I was looking in the background. <laughs> yeah, that's true. In they, the, the opening. The boy casting was way better than oh the, my than God. the casting in terms of authenticity. May I present a counter though? Mm. Um, yes. Point of view? Maybe these guys don't give a flying fuck what these people think. <laughs> and that's the point of view of the movie, too. It's, it's, it's really plugged in to that, like, mathematical fucking shit of, like, what can I do to hook up with a girl that is hot? And it's, it's fucked up, but I think that that's sort of capturing, like, some sort of truth that, at the end of the movie, the, it, it doesn't stick the landing. It's, like, still right. doesn't give a fuck about them. That would be fine if the movie didn't want to pin its emotional catharsis to them learning some supposed lesson about how to treat these women with more respect yeah. when it's clear they have not learned that. Yes. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that shit was added by, um, but by Jake Kasdan. Yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> the shot of, of him going down the escalator and looking back at Michael Sarah, that's a good shot. That really sums up the way that their relationship has changed, which is the emotional arc of the film, but trying to build that moment around these women without having done the work it just it feels worse almost end it with the sleepover end it with just the two of them in the mall don't put them in that there. last scene really does reek of like if you're a nice guy you'll get the girl like it's it's not a good <laughs> it should have absolutely ended at the sleepover they should have left it completely open emma stone we love emma stone right she's great in this first movie. film role she first was movie. doing a lot with a very little how do we feel about her side bang Oh, so 2007. It was great. She looks amazing. She's perfectly gorgeous, but, you know, she's got red hair, so she's she can't be totally hot, you know? I'm sorry to do exactly what the characters in the movie do, which is just immediately talk about her appearance. But to be fair... (laughs) It's all we have to talk about. It's all we have to talk about. I just thought it was interesting that she wears the side bang the next day on the side that isn't fucked up i don't know if that hair is like constructed in that certain way that you can't style it to the other side it is it is okay it is it's so she has no choice yeah. okay it's actually cut shorter yeah but i found that very funny that they kind of used the side bang to accentuate mm. the injury that mm-hmm. she was dealt yeah with what little they give her she made a huge impression absolutely she did yeah, yeah. i remember seeing her and just being like she's amazing we need more of this person and considering becca is presented as being like the more important of the female characters it's crazy how much she gets lost in the noise relative to jules yeah Yeah. it's not like they get more screen time but i don't know what it is about emma stone or the scenes that she's in the way those are structured but she does jump off the screen and you could tell that she was going to be a movie star i mean she's just electric emma stone's amazing but also jonah hill's more the star and that's who his love interest is so they like yeah. cast a, a really strong love interest for him. They also have way more natural chemistry than Evan and Becca ever would. Yeah. Evan's yeah. one true love is definitely maybe. That's the most chemistry I've ever seen between <laughs> two people on Arrested Development. <laughs> Becca is not his type. No. He needs someone who's going to take charge, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he does. He's such a little spaghetti boy. <laughs> anyway. We haven't talked about Fogel yet. Oh, I loved him. Fogel. Ah, yeah. So when I saw this movie in high school and and, everyone was joking about McLovin, I remember thinking this character was just like a waste of space. Like he's such a dweeb that like, I don't even, I can't relate to him. He's too far, whatever. Christopher Mintz Plus is so fucking good in this movie. He is perfect in this movie. It's not even a performance. It transcends performance. (laughs) And I didn't respect that in 2007 and I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, this is the biggest thing from Superbad. 
this right here, which is like, it's so funny that for this movie, the, the standout scene is three dudes standing in a parking lot yelling at each other. <laughs> Not moving, just standing in one place. Just screaming at each other and bickering over this, such a ridiculous, I don't know what it is that's so magical about this, this moment, but it's people just, there's t-shirts. I think it's a combination of the chemistry between the three guys and the ID itself. And just Fogel's insane confidence in everything <laughs> that he thought of, like between the age and the name and just how shocked the other two guys are that he just has this, that he had this thought process on the fake ID. It's so funny. I wish he was the star of the movie. I wish the whole movie was just him. <laughs> I mean, aside from the sort of uh, the whole cop adventure that seems very dark in in 2021 aged, lighting well yeah it hasn't aged well i'll get there although I'll i think it's pretty well. dark in the movie too yeah exactly <laughs> but yeah i totally agree with you is he like he's this character is fascinating this performance is great they literally posted flyers in local high schools chris Roman's plaza was a 17 year old kid in high school who sent a headshot to the casting director that he took on his phone <laughs> <laughs> and they were just like this is the one Oh my and god! He rules. He's perfect, and his like his scrapes seem so much more genuine. Like the way that things lead from one thing to another with that whole storyline, just that was the not boring part of the movie for me. <laughs> Should we just go straight into that? Since like we have two parallel storylines: McLovin Fogel with the cops, and then Seth and Evan trying to get the booze. Yeah, they they branch off because Fogel is going to buy booze for them, and he is the victim of a robbery at the liquor store. They think there's an error of communication. They think he got arrested and they're separated. And now he's arrested with the cops, Seth Rogen and Bill Hader. This was, I was so excited to see this movie. It was a big deal because <laughs> these guys were so funny. This part of the movie works for me. It worked for me then. And, and it worked for me this time too. I think a lot of it's just Rogen and Hader are really funny. They're like they're just funny guys and they're very funny in the movie. I think it's partially that the humor is broader and more slapstick here. Like, it's not just like people cursing or dicks being funny. It's like actual setups and jokes and inversions that are, are, are clever. But I also think as we were just alluding to that, the turn when they go from just kind of wild and fun to legitimately dangerous to our characters is really effective and narratively satisfying. Yeah. It's weird. The structure of the movie makes it seem as though they are going to be the bad guys of this movie. And they, and they kind, kind, of, of, they kind are. of are, but in the end, the movie like doesn't really give a fuck. It's like embrace being bad, embrace being super bad, at, at least the way I saw it. Like in the end of the movie, Fogel still loves them and they go out with a literal bang. Yeah, that might be a, a downside. But until that point, I mean, like basically through the point where they show up at the party and Seth has to rescue Evan. I, I really like everything that they're doing there. Granted, it's simply talking from a, a perspective of, you know, like white privilege to not find them frightening up front right like like the, to, to to be able to enjoy the wild ride which is so dangerous and irresponsible <laughs> when they're yeah. waving a gun around a restaurant like they just and he's bill Hader's like no no don't do it don't do it. like and they just have no idea what they're doing and i was kind of like is this a really accurate portrayal of the police in america maybe it very well could be very accurate and yeah it's it's fucking crazy but i think my thing about all this is that you got to remember that this is a movie designed for 17 year olds 17 year old boys yeah and what are the three things 17 year old boys love the most they love getting with girls or boys they love having sex they love getting drunk and high and they love guns and power fantasies they just want to have some control in a world that just wants to spit, chew them up and spit them out so like I think that this is just them being like, how fucking crazy would it be if like two cops with guns, they have lines in this movie. They're like, what's it like to have a gun? And it's like, it's like having another dick. Like <laughs> that you could kill people. You got to always remember who this movie is designed for. And there is a thematic <laughs> parallel between these men who never matured and these kids who are kind of on the verge of deciding whether they're going to mature or be stuck in arrested development. But I don't want to belabor the point anymore. Izzy, I feel like you've got opinions on this. <laughs> well, I'm kind of struck. I was struggling with the, it's really interesting to hear that they were writing this when they were in high school because I was trying to figure out whether they're making these jokes, like 
you can hide a lot behind a shitty character, someone who's supposed to be a shitty person. Sure. You can make a lot of shitty jokes and say, oh, yeah, I mean, this guy's supposed to be an asshole. Of course he says something like that. But then, like, is that, but is that really what you think is funny? Kind of, you know, I don't know if that's mm. very clear, but. So was there something about the cops that, that struck you in that way? I think a good example of that would be the homophobic slurs yeah. that Seth's character uses all the time, which Seth Rogen has come out afterwards and said, you know, I, he regrets that, that like that was not something that he had any intentionality behind. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm more thinking about the teenagers, not so much the cops, just the way that they talk. A lot of the stuff that doesn't age well, they can blame on the fact that the characters are supposed to be bad people. Right. But I don't think that that was the intention when they wrote it, that it was mm. going to be a shitty character saying a shitty thing. That's not going to age well, obviously. They're like, no, this is funny. I think it's funny. I'm going to say it. You know, that's one of the big problems I always had with the Hangover movies, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It felt like they used comedy as a license to celebrate bad behavior. Exactly. Yep. Which sound, makes me sound like such a fucking prude. I hate that I just <laughs> said that sentence out loud. But I mean, it, there is there is truth to that, right? Where if, if they're not going to bother to explore the ramifications of those attitudes and those opinions that the jokes express, then the jokes enable those attitudes and opinions you know it's a really fine line that you have to walk and there's no consequences for anybody for any of this bad behavior which i think is the difference right. is that you can sell you can like make comedy where bad behavior is done and it can be funny but there's usually a consequence of some kind at the end and there's basically none i actually think maybe there there is a consequence and it and sort of the most interesting one the movie could possibly come up with which is that their friendship is deteriorating because of who they've become as people because Seth is who he is and because Evan who he is. It's not just about them going to separate schools. It's also about the fact that Seth's always talking about sex. And Evan wants to try and build a real relationship. Mm. Well, Evan's more more capable of like being cool, I think, just by virtue of, you know, Michael Sarah versus Jonah Hill. I don't know. It seems like Evan's got a little more cachet in the world than than Seth does. And as far as these characters concerned, losing this friendship is the biggest consequence they could suffer for, for anything. Yeah, I want to keep talking about the cops, though. We got to pivot back to the cops. Because <laughs> it's so strange that that's in the movie. That, like, there's this whole subplot. It's this and whole I, separate story. I do think it's just, like, you know, I've, I've tried to, like, validate it thematically before. Like, oh, they're, they're the guys that, that they could become. But, like, I don't think Seth and Evan are ever going to become, like, fucking police officers. Like, they don't seem no. like police officer types. I just think that, like, this is, like, the true 13-year-old script writing coming out. Like, wouldn't it be crazy if there was, like, cops that were getting fucked up and just, like, played with their guns as though they were, like, 15-year-old boys? And, like, it's just so funny that the movie devotes so much time to these ridiculous cop characters that, like, shouldn't exist. You remember the scene where they're driving in the squad car and they get a call and there's the voice of some guy being like, I need backup. There's blood everywhere. And they just shut off. <laughs> they just shut off the radio. It's like f fantastical. Yeah. They, they would, they would be deposed immediately, <laughs> but it, it is kind of like fantasy in a way from straight from the mind of like a 16 year old boy. Something I noticed about the cop scenes, at least in the first, like three quarters of the movie is most of the scenes uh, in the high school. There's like no, there's very little background noise and almost no music. There's the opening sequence and then there's like no music and kind of no action, just to so much dialogue. And then you get to the cops and then all of a sudden there's a ton of music and there's action that kind of played into the fantasy feeling. Like, cause the beginning, it kind of felt like the office a little bit. There's like, yeah. it's very static and the, it, the background noise feels very good canned. Yeah. And then it's like a breath of fresh air when the cops come in. Cause it's like, oh, finally we're moving. Like something's. It's not just talking. We're getting a little There's bit more action happening on screen. There's plot narrative actually happening because now we have to go to the bar. Now we have to stop the guy, the drunk. Yeah. Now we have to, you know, I think that's really astute. Dang it. <laughs> it sums it all up with the cops at the last shot, which is like one of my favorite shots in any comedy ever. Fogel doesn't learn anything. All he learns is that he should just continue to post on his insane confidence and that nothing bad will happen. Only good. Maybe some bad things will happen. But in the end, he'll get to fuck. He'll get to get away with it and become more popular 
And like, it just ends with him getting to shoot that gun that he'd been wanting to shoot all night. And it's just like, the last shot is him just going like, tight. And that's the last we ever see of Fogel, ever. That's the moral of the story. It's like, this was tight. <laughs> and like, you just have to operate with the movie on that level. Like, yeah, that was like, pretty you tight. You have to agree. That was tight. <laughs> For Fogel, it was tight. Let's talk about the the house party, the adult house party. How old are they supposed Seth to be? And Evan go to. I I think like like five. They're like post college, pre thirties. Okay. Yeah, I okay. definitely went to a party or two like this in in Orange, California. This was very very real. It's like people have been hanging around the college town a little too long. Okay. Okay. I was wondering if they were supposed to be in college and they just didn't seem quite. It seems a little There's too like old for that. There's like some frat bros that are doing cocaine. The guy right. from the liquor store is at this party. He's like, <laughs> right. he stole all this liquor from the liquor yeah. store. It's just a party of degenerates, basically. <laughs> Young, aimless degenerates who fight and party. Yeah, like, looks like the worst place in the fucking world. <laughs> it's an ugly house in the middle of nowhere where Wait. everyone is unpleasant. <laughs> yeah. But let's talk about, let's talk about Joe Lou Trujillo, the guy from Wet Hot yeah. American Summer. Yeah. The sketchy ass guy who's, who's like, <laughs> I got a warrant out. It's just so hits him with the car. <laughs> He's like, well, brings him to the house and immediately gets kicked out. He tries to be bros with them. He's like, he's like in the car and he hears a. Uh, them talking to one of the girls on the phone and he's like yeah you're gonna get with her tonight and you're just like it's so creepy it's so funny uh it's kind of random though it's not it's thematically just like a random party that's sketchy this is another moment where uh they're being white kids white guys really makes that an adventure and not a horrifying experience <laughs> of being yeah. taken in somebody's car to somewhere you don't know to like some party where everyone's terrifying. That would not be funny for anybody else. <laughs> they they have a lot of confidence in their plans and schemes in this movie. An insane amount, really. <laughs> I, I would have given up after the liquor store. I've been like, yeah, Which is why it's like, just talk to the girls, maybe? <laughs> you, you clearly could shoot pretty straight with, with like just having a, but then they get kind of awkward when they when they actually have to go to the task of talking to the girls. So they, they need the crutch of the alcohol in their minds, but I think if they just tried a couple times, they'd be fine. Which is another thing, is the whole, you got to get girls drunk to sleep with them. Yeah. And then they're always the aggressors, and you have to decide, not tonight. (laughs) You're too drunk. (laughs) Yeah, it's Like, they get to be the good guy and say, like, oh, no, I'm going to turn you away. I'm going to be the noble one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if one of them does, there's also... Right, it um, happens in the opposite direction. Yeah, it or happens he's the kind of in the opposite. The, yeah. And then Fogel has consensual sex with uh, with Alexa. <laughs> yeah. Everything works out perfectly for Fogel. It's fucking tight. Before we get there, though, I, I wanted to say about the, the adult house party, it's another great example of the Apatow style, right? Is that this house is full of underserved, underappreciated comic actors that he has just collected around him. You've got Joe Latrigolo. You've got Kevin Corrigan as Mark, the house owner. You've got David Crumholz. Just oh, hanging right. out there. Martin Starr is there wearing a hat and playing a <laughs> bongo. Danny McBride is kicking around in the background. Like, it's just everyone in the house is a guy doing comedy in Los Angeles in their 20s who hasn't broken out yet. And Apatow's like, I'll give you I'll give you two seconds. I'll give you 30 seconds. I'll give you a minute. There's space for you here. I think what, another fault of the movie, though, is like it is not very thematic in any way. It's just kind of like sketchy right. party. Like, and that's it. There's no more to it. And each each scenario that happens at the sketchy party is like, it's like the opposite of something like one of my favorite movies of all time. I think we talked about it is the um, Pee Wee's Big Adventure when he walks into the, the biker bar and like, it's just so <laughs> sketched out perfectly that like, he is not supposed to be here and we understand all the bikers and like, it's funny that he dances to tequila and there's like an arc there. Whereas this right. party is just a random assortment of not even like dangerous people, just just random people. And this is a movie that has two parties, right? But do the parties tell us anything about each other? Does the way the adults behave no, reflect at all. all on the way the teens behave or vice versa? It's not all really. in service. The, the, there's like, that's what I've learned about this movie watching it this time around. Like there's, there's no thematicness to any of this movie. <laughs> it's just a gag. It's mostly just a gag machine with like 2% soul, but it doesn't care about trying to say anything about the random party. It just cares about, now this guy's getting punched. Now there's period girl 
purity-ing on, on Seth's shitty 70s pants. Now he's trying to steal more alcohol. Like, it's, it doesn't he's care about the world Alcohol inside detergent containers. And again, it's because these are all stories that either happened to Seth or, and Evan or happened to people they knew. Right. So like, oh, we got to we got to put the detergent in there. We got to put the period blood in there. It is what you make of it. Like the the big moments in this movie never fully landed with me in the way that some of them have with with a lot of people like the period blood thing or even the dicks. Like for me, it's all about the bickering, like that mm. authentic teen bickering in the McLovin scene or just them fretting. Like, that's what I love about Superbad. It makes it like an amazing movie to me. <laughs> the gross out comedy shit is like not as as important to me as the chemistry. Right. So anyway. It did seem with the party scene that they were and all the cameos from people that you'd get to know better as you see these movies, the Jet Apatow machine. It did seem like they were kind of filling a hole in the writing with just like, let's put all our friends Do in this scene. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> these guys are funny when they're together. <laughs> We'll just and it's like even thing. the threatening guys, the threatening guys are like these, these like yeah, fucking Martin Star is going to kick your ass, really. <laughs> but maybe, so I mean, in, in a way, that's kind of authentic. Maybe that makes it sketchier and not as obvious. I don't know. Right. It's not going to be some big muscle bound dude. It's going to be, <laughs> you know, Kevin Corrigan, you know, right. a slightly beer bellied 30 year old who's just pissed off and drunk. He's going to punch <laughs> you in your fucking face. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, I'm of two minds about the whole thing. Uh, talking about the bickering, I, I want to go on a tangent to talk about profanity and swearing. Mm. Okay. I don't know if this was your guys' experience or not, but as I remember it from the culture wars in the 90s, profanity was a big deal. In the 90s and into the 2000s, that was a, still a taboo in American culture. And there was a yeah. lot of... Bull works against it. That was one of the big sort of culture war fights that was happening at that time. And that changed pretty dramatically in the 2000s, I think because of the internet, right? It was harder to control communication. It just became more ubiquitous and more prevalent. And part of that was that I aged through the, the, the ages where that mattered to me during that time. But I also think that there was a real shift. I remember before the first time I ever saw Big Lebowski, the thing that I knew about it was that it had more F-bombs in it than any other movie. Nobody talks about that anymore. That's not relevant to the Big Lebowski's legacy anymore, but it was in the 90s. Yeah, I think a big thing that you're also missing is shit like South Park. Right. Like, it's it just like it became more acceptable on TV to curse. There were comedy properties that were pushing that envelope. South Park is a great example. I think Superbad is on the vanguard of that too. This movie got a lot of attention for how foul-mouthed it was in 2007. But watching it now, like, yeah, there's a lot of profanity in this movie, and it's occasionally a little wearing, but it's not surprising. It's not shocking. I think in 2007, it kind of was. I still found it a little shocking. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> was, Tell me more. Well, I guess it was just the sort of, yeah, the fact that it was cursing with almost zero content besides cursing. Just she looks curse. like she'd be a good... Yeah, it just like... I mean, which felt authentically teenager because it was just like... Two kids with nothing to say going on <laughs> and putting in as many curse words to feel adult as possible. But yeah, I think maybe in subsequent movies, uh, they've toned that down a little bit. I don't know. I feel like if anyone's going to curse it to these guys, like they, I feel like they do a great job of cursing on like a lot of teenagers would who <laughs> are just cursing for the sake of cursing. I feel like these guys use it really to their advantage to make whatever they're trying to say m more poetic or whatever jo jonah hill is a, is a swear artist a little bit yeah i think he's really good at it like we wouldn't watch the movie if if he wasn't i, I mentioned earlier that i was going to make the comparison to american pie this is one of the places where i think that's really telling a decade has gone by between two definitive teen sex comedies and one's got a lot more sex mm -hmm. nudity it, you know uh, lots of jokes in that regard that's american pie and then one is just full of swearing and profanity and curses and imaginative descriptions but not actual content. Like there's a really interesting change here that happened. Yeah. And I think super bad's way more authentic than American pie. Definitely. So I don't know. I, I think it's just the Apatow machine has kind of enabled that style of comedy versus whatever American pie was going for, which honestly I think was more about just like showing the sex than anything else. American pie. You didn't give a shit about Jason Biggs banter with his friends. 
It was all about how he fucked a pie. And how they right. they they live cast Shannon Elizabeth's boobs. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like that was the reason to go see that movie. Whereas Super Bad, like, you're not going to see Super Bad. Maybe some people thought you were going to see Super Bad for, for sex, but like I knew going into it. Like, look at the poster. It's these three dorks. Like, there's no sex right. at all. Compare that to American Pie, where it's like a woman <laughs> holding two pies. Yeah, that's a good point. It does seem hypersexualized to me, but that's yeah, at the time, that would have been... It's. I guess the difference would be, like, here the sexualization is rooted in the characters who are the perspective of the film, where in American Pie, it's in the perspective of the filmmakers who aren't really inhabiting the character's POV. They're just inserting it over the top. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I think, I think um, Superbad is a much healthier movie for the world than yeah. American Pie. Um. It's on the road to healthy. Yeah, that's a little, I don't know. I'm comparing it to American Pie. For healthier, sure. yeah, healthier. Let's, keep, let's get through the end of the plot. So <laughs> there's some drama. You know, Seth and Evan have tension. I, there was a line that Fogel said that was like, when, when um, Seth finds out that they're going to be rooming together and Fogel's just like, we should have never had to hide our arrangement. <laughs> just laughed so hard. <laughs> He takes such offense to, to hiding the arrangement. I thought that was so good. Well, again, he's pretty pretty perfect in that role. Just his like lisp and everything is spitty, yeah. spitty way he's of talking. It. The Ugh. the small glasses, the glasses that are like too small for his face and are always crooked. Yeah. The, the mouth breathing. He never closes his mouth the entire movie. <laughs> it's also funny that we never get a sense other than the very end of like what other people think of Fogel. It's only through the eyes of Seth and Evan, and they just think. They detest him, <laughs> or especially Seth. Seth really thinks he's terrible. He just hates his guts. Vogel doesn't even get the respect of like being spat on by the bully. And yeah, so then they go to the party. They have failed interactions with the girls, with the exception of Vogel. Uh, fun fact, because Chris Furman's Plus was 17 at the time of filming, there were really strict rules about what they could and could not do with him uh, and the <laughs> actress together. In the movie, you'll notice that there are no simulated sex acts with the two of them on screen together at the same time. Right. There's some straddling, and then there's some close-ups <laughs> of them individually. Uh, <laughs> what do we think about the party and the resolution? Is it just shitty screenwriting? Like, the whole shit with Jules and with Becca? I, I think Jules especially is like... Jonah Hill, when he gets drunk, he's horrifying. It's really, he, it's yeah. really sad. And she just sort of um, does this like... <laughs> Yeah, I guess she, we can and talk. She like, care. Yeah, I'd like and to do that. It's not it's, charming. It's totally at all. right. You're totally right that like they gave her no reason to like this guy. This disgusting fucking guy who earlier in the day was hu dry humping her without her knowing. Like he's yeah. done absolutely nothing to, other than getting the booze. And like it does beg the question of like is she trying to hook up with him because he got the booze? Is she just humoring him? Like what is going on? Cuz I gotta be honest, when, when he is like, let's go talk, it was a little creepy when she's like, yeah, let's go talk. Like, it, it got to that point where you were kind of like, this is scary, what, what the way that Seth is acting right now. And then she does ultimately get violently hurt by him uh, <laughs> because of how drunk he is. So, yeah, it's kind of shitty. It's, it's not the movie's strong moment. And her one personality trait is that she doesn't drink. In all honesty... I feel like the movie should have just completely abandoned the girls. Uh, yeah. They don't matter to the movie at all. No. They aren't characters. They're just girls yep. in the movie's eyes. And like, they should have just taken their shots and not gotten it. Like, it probably would have happened. Well, I kind of felt like these movies, maybe just because what came before was so much worse, and I'm not remembering what came before, but I feel like these movies got a lot of credit for having better female characters than <laughs> yeah. other comedies. And I can't understand why now watching it. It just, cause Emma Stone is so like, she's a good character, like just the tone of her voice. The fact that she has this deep voice, raspy, she doesn't seem like the typical girl. And so they right. just a hundred percent rely on Emma Stone, not the typical girl. That's what you Well, is. yeah, because your your baseline is American Pie, where they have uh, this one time at band camp, I, I stuck a flute up my pussy. And right. before that, you have 
Revenge of the Nerds, where they're Porkies. like making out with the girl with a mask on. Like it's so it is a step up compared to those older movies. We haven't talked about Martha McIsaac very much. The actress who played Becca. We don't honest we honestly don't need to. <laughs> She's like, again, has nothing to say. <laughs> Her only good scene is when she's acting really drunk because she's pretty good at acting drunk. She was genuinely drunk. Both she and Michael Sarah got very drunk to film that scene. Wow. Uh... Well, Michael Sarah was only 18. That's illegal. Yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah this I can really only tell you what I read bad. on The Ringer. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it plays, but again, it's kind of ruined by like the whole plot situation like that Izzy was describing where like he gets to be the good guy because he's freaked out by her crazy. Yeah, she's too aggressive, and, you know, she gets to tell him later, I wrote down, thank you for being such a nice guy. Who said that? Right. Yeah, that about? she said like that. that. She said that, and that's like, ugh, that's bad. But that's how I think it played at the time, is that he was being a nice guy. Yeah, the fact that he doesn't have sex with her is played that he did, he did like the right thing. Like, he's being extraordinarily nice. Like, most guys yeah. would have done it. Although I think the movie doesn't present it as an act of nobility in the moment. That whole time, he's like, anal about like how that event is going on he's like you know when they're taking off the sweatshirt he's like well he's like being weird about it Be careful this is vintage i don't want you to damage it and he like freaks out when she throws up and stuff like that like he's not being like no this is wrong he's really uncomfortable in the situation <laughs> for lots of other reasons and just luckily gets to use nobility as the excuse to cover up his own fears and inadequacies yeah, I guess I guess the big thing is like he gets to be the smart person in the room and she's yeah. just fucking crazy. Despite the entire movie was his plan to fuck this girl. Like all of a sudden she's the crazy one. Yeah. Uh, even though he's literally run for the co- from the cops, committed multiple felonies in order to sleep with her. It's like, "Oh, now all of a sudden he's the smart one." We get the sleepover scene. We get the boop on the nose. Boop. And then we get the mall. You guys got anything to say about this? I mean, I think that the friendship arc works. I think that largely because the actors are playing the subtext that we learn about later, that, that, you know, that Seth knows about the rooming arrangement, that he feels left behind because of the Dartmouth situation. All that stuff that gets revealed about the movie definitely colors their relationship the entire time. So I find the sleepover scene a pretty, a pretty solid wrap up, but I'll admit by this point, I was tuned out. I was bored. I was just bored with this movie. I don't understand you guys. I was having a ball. The party scene is so goddamn long. Then the the party scene has this the part where Bill Hader dances to the rap song, which is like the greatest moment. <laughs> oh my I've god! Ever seen. With the "Don't Trust the Police," is that what yeah. it was? Yeah. I know it's fucked up, but like just the way he's dancing and like the way they clear out that party, it's so fucking stupid and and insane and. Yes, there's real world shit, but again, I'm just going to go on the 13-year-old defense. It was written by 16-year-olds. With the sleepover, the part where he says, I'm afraid to live with strangers, that was the most relatable line in the whole movie. (laughs) That was the only thing that I was like, that has nothing to do. That's like, yeah, I'm afraid. That was totally the only thing that I related to my high school experience (laughs) (laughs) at all. Wrapping up, we already talked about the mall scene, kind of weird, kind of unnecessary, kind of telegraphing, like, exchange friend for girl a little bit. (laughs) When you grow up, you get girl, and then friend is over kind of thing. It seemed really (laughs) thrown together. He, like, apologizes for nothing. It would have been so much better if they just ended it with the friends. And great, great end credit song. Curtis Mayfield, what a wonderful song with that harp. I love that. It's one of my favorite credits drops of all time. The credits were great. Opening and closing. Opening and closing. Absolutely. And that's all you really need for a hit movie. Great, <laughs> great tracks, opening and closing. It. But having like that opening sequence and that ending sequence makes it feel like it's going to be this epic movie. And that's how I remembered feeling about it. That this was like not. a big thing. And then you watch it and there's just kind of nothing <laughs> aside from the McLovin story. For me, line. I was like, yes, finally, this is it. <laughs> Let's talk legacy. Film had a budget of $20 million. It opened August 17th in first place to 33 million, went on to gross 121 million domestic, 170 million worldwide. Huge hit. Yeah. Back when comedies could make a play at the box office, which doesn't happen anymore. Unbelievable. It even got a little awards buzz. 
it was nominated for best movie at the MTV Movie Awards. Oh, well, that doesn't count. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like best picture, which I would have voted for it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> was this Nat's 2007 best picture front runner? Oh, no. But this was best comedy at the Golden Globes for sure. <laughs> uh, Hell yeah. You have any uh, tech for us? Yeah. MySpace makes an appearance, not in person, but J- Joe Lou Trujillo mentions it. He's like, you guys got a MySpace? And that just took me way back. Because, like, it's just funny that, like, at that point, MySpace was already sketchy as fuck. Like, <laughs> this is the dude who's asking if you have a MySpace. Well, they're also talking about, like, uh, the porn sites that they're going to subscribe to. Oh, yeah. Which sounded right. very old-fashioned. Yeah. yeah. And they watch the, the, he gives them the VHS of this, of him being punched in the face of McLovin. Yeah, the cops uh, give him the VHS afterward. Yep, and then yep. they're taking a picture with the old phone of the period stain. Wow, Izzy, like, we gotta bring you on to... for the 2007 tech every time. Yeah, I remember the themes. I was taking notes on those. The <laughs> fact that these 17 or 18 year olds are going to pay for a subscriber porn site <laughs> tells you a lot about them. That they are not normal. Because <laughs> that is psychotic i don't think i've ever actually met someone that that does that so if you listener subscribe to porn sites and pay money please email bttmpod at gmail.com tell us all about it and leave a five-star review and leave a five-star yeah. review. if you write it in a five-star review we'll read it out loud for everyone to hear but let's get to themes if izzy's themes. Ready, ready to talk some themes izzy what do you got the theme of no one wanting to be in 2007 it's all 70s nostalgia true it's like any time but now yeah, yeah, exactly. 2007 doesn't have a culture. Well, I like to call it iPod culture because it's like <laughs> you have everything from before. Right. But nothing from now. You can take anything you want from any of the decades that, that preceded it, and it's just all loaded on your sleek, emotionless, corporate ass right iPod. Box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can set dress it all you want, but the fact remains it's not fucking vinyl. You're listening to it on an iPod, and it's been <laughs> digitally compressed to a much shittier version of what the real thing is. So maybe th- maybe that's what we should call it from now on, iPod culture. iPod culture. <laughs> the only thing that I thought was interesting was the scene where Evan's playing the video games. There's like this really weird throwaway line that isn't funny and is just in the movie for no reason. What about the terrorists? When he says... He says, why am I killing these terrorists? They just keep coming back. What's the point? And I was like, is, oh. this, like a, is this like a weird dig at like the war on terror? Like a really simplistic, uninformed, like we shouldn't be killing them because they're just going to multiply and there'll be more. But yeah, they just kind of threw it in the movie. Like that is a cutting room floor kind of line that made its way in for some reason. I think and that I might understand. be the smartest line in the movie. I think... <laughs> yeah you can't kill all the terrorists you gotta change their minds <laughs> hearts and minds campaign i got three. First off isn't high school the ultimate quagmire does a quagmire have an ending in sight you know like the the whole iraq war thing is like no end in sight we're here we don't know when we're leaving well that one's a bit of a throwaway but i thought it was relevant just because of how i remember high school but i did have two new ones i wanted to talk about okay the first one is bullies. Mm, bullies. Bullies have cropped up a lot this season. They were in Stop the Yard. They were in Perfume. They were in Shrek. They were in King of Kong. They were in Harry Potter. They were in Transformers. I don't remember bullies being that big in our, our 1990 season. Obviously, they're a big part of like 80s films. Yeah. But they seem to have fallen out of favor. To go back to the comparison with like American Pie, Stifler's an asshole, but he's not a bully. There's no real bullies in that movie. Right. Yeah, there's not really a bad guy in that one. But something had changed by 2007. You know, bullying was a lot was in the news a lot at that time. Zero tolerance policies had become a big school implementation, a big part of of school education policy. Uh, and there was a lot of renewed national attention because of that. So maybe it was more in the zeitgeist again, or maybe it's just a cyclical thing where the kids who grew up watching 80s movies are now making movies and they remember the bully characters. Just think that's interesting. It's weird, though, because the bullies in this movie aren't the bullies of yesteryear. They're just sort of present, but they're not the main focus of the movie. True. It's not the main. The bully doesn't even really get a name. That's not what's making their life miserable. Yeah, it's not. What's, exactly. It's not what's making their life miserable. It's more just like another fact of life. And that's true in basically all of these movies. Think about the bully in Transformers, Michaela's boyfriend, or uh, in Shrek, 
where they're like not it's like Lancelot for one scene for Arthur before he goes on his journey. They're not the <laughs> primary antagonists. Yeah, they're just they're just jerks. Fact of life. Yeah. Fact of life. The other one I want to talk about is cinephilia. Nat, your favorite word. Ugh. Cringe. There's been a lot of movies that have made, you know, copious reference to other films. Hot Fuzz, Grindhouse, Walk Hard. You have all these film literate directors making movies. Right. And it's so odd that in this raunchy T comedy, they're name dropping Orson Welles and making visual allusions to Dr. Strangelove. What was the name dropping Orson Welles? He was the Orson Welles of ass getting because he right. peaked too yeah. early. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. I laughed out loud when he said, I'm sorry that the Coen brothers aren't directing porno. Right. Uh, you know, what is that? It's not artistic enough. <laughs> also, that was so funny. a weird reference to Big Lebowski, too, where they did direct a porno. Mm. See, why couldn't they have made them film nerds? I don't understand. They and are have them film just, nerds. He but wears not a, a Bruce Lee shirt. Nerds. It's not relevant to their characters. Their at all. priority is to get ass. That's the, in the movie. In the 40, in the hour and 50 minutes we see them, they never go to AV club. I'm with you, Izzy. <laughs> I think that this is also, this presages a lot of what's going to happen in the next decade of movies as the internet continues to grow and expand. Films now often ask their audiences to be much more literate about their subject matter, whatever it is, than they used to. Right. A great example is like the connected universe. Instead of making sequels or standalone films in a franchise, now everything connects together. So you're expected to have a baseline understanding of who all these people are because that information is just so much more accessible than it was before. And I think that this kind of thing here where you can have characters making references to things that your average audience member might not know is, is a, is a great predictor of that. It's the canary in the coal mine. It is very film literate. They even make a reference to Charlie's Angels full throttle, which was pretty impressive <laughs> alongside Orson, Orson Welles. They're like, we're going to go full throttle like Charlie's Angels too. Yeah. It's so ridiculous. I think, yeah. And it's also just the fact that they're improving. Like that's the right. kind of thing you would just say off the cuff and not write into a script. Cause it's so weird to make that reference. But every time that they make a reference like that, they probably did it half dozen other ways. And that's the one they kept. That is the one. That, yeah. That's very true. That's very mm. true. Yeah, so this has been an amazingly weird episode, I think. We talked about super bad, and it was kind of kind of like we were of different minds. I feel like most super bad podcasts you would listen to would just have the people quoting all the lines, so maybe we are uh coming out on top here a little bit with a little more nuance. We stood around for a while, we bickered, and we didn't really get anywhere accomplish anything. It was the perfect super bad episode. We didn't curse exactly. enough. Though. We should have just been saying fuck every other word. It's, P it's in the G, Nat. P in the G. I mean, what is it? The, the king of pound young Vaj? I, that <laughs> oh, God. Made me laugh so hard. Supposedly, this movie popularized the, the expression down to fuck. Really? Yeah, that's a weird that one. It was like an improv of Jonah Hill's based off of like, uh, like a, a gang that like he knew growing up. And then it of blew course. up because of Jersey Shore. Like nobody used to say that. I guess. No way. I guess so. Yeah, that's that makes sense. It's kind of like MILF with um American Pie. <laughs> <laughs> Izzy just made a great face. I missed it. I was looking at my notes. Damn it. Um uh, yeah, I don't know, guys. I think I think Super Bad is a really funny movie. It makes me laugh. And I've I've come to terms with the fact that it's kind of dumb and has no soul. And that it's not a movie to take any lessons from. It is just a gag machine. Izzy, do you have a final review? <laughs> uh, my favorite joke in the whole movie, and the thing that got the biggest laugh from me and my Jonah, was when they were lying on the ground and the cops have the guns on them, and then Michael Sarah <laughs> just pops up and runs away. That was the funniest thing <laughs> in the whole movie. It's fastest fucking kid alive. He's so fast. <laughs> Best fucking get alive. Here's my review. Super bad, more like just fine. Oh my god. I was hoping we could get through the <laughs> yeah. whole thing without a bad a bad headline from a newspaper, but we didn't make it. <laughs> In the final moment, you did it. I wrote a few down. I didn't say them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ben, take us out. <laughs> Follow us on social media at BTTM pod on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Email us at BTTM pod at gmail.com. And please leave us a five-star review. Maybe you're tired of hearing us say that. 
but we haven't gotten any since we started saying it. What does that say about us? I'm not sure. Izzy gave us one, by the way. I think she's the only guest who's actually, and Jesse did one too. But thank you, Izzy. I could tell, and Jonah as well, unless that was Jonah Hill. Uh, it was Jonah Hill. He's a big fan. <laughs> wow. I hope he doesn't listen to this episode. <laughs> Speaking of Izzy, Izzy, do you have anything you want to plug or mention to our audience if they liked hearing from you? Is there somewhere else where they can hear more? No, there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. This is the This the is the only, only place you'll ever hear me content is he's putting out in the world is yep. uh, honored that you've chosen this as your <laughs> this, mark. this little tiny corner of the internet <laughs> fantastic yeah thanks for coming on izzy and thank you we'll have you again for a movie that you like how about mystery that? man yeah. sounds good yeah mystery, mystery man, man. Be there. Yeah. that's 99 right that's a pretty yeah. that, that's a good year we'll get around to that one thank you to andy gagnon for our music and jackie saltzman for our artwork what's next week oh next week is going to be our special episode right ben Next week, we might be mixing things up. Or we might not. Yeah. You'll have to tune in to find out. <laughs> Just cut all of this out in this overlong <laughs> episode. So, for Back to the Movies, this has been Nat. And I'm Ben. And we'll see you next week when we go Back to the Movies. Oh my god. Super bad. Hey, do you know who came up with that title? Who? It was David Krumholtz. Hanging out with oh. Seth Rogen, smoking some weed. It's crazy how many of Seth Rogen's stories start that way. Surprised there wasn't more weed in this movie. They never went for the weed. It's all about the alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Weed is so much more their thing. Yeah.